Right, so it's now my pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Gavin Brown from the School of Computer Science in, at the University of Manchester, who's going to give us a very interesting talk, because I've already seen it once, uh, on how to make computers think. Thank you very much. All right, so before we begin, do you remember right back at the beginning of the day, Professor Jim Miles was here. He was the head of school, and you gave him a big welcome saying you were enjoying yourselves. You remember? Yeah, yeah. So I want to beat him. He's my boss. I want to beat him. So, oh, I've just noticed he's over there. <laughs> so, even though there's only half of you here, are you all having a good time? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I did that in one there. All right. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about something I find fascinating. This subject, making computers think. This is what I do for a living every single day, and I think it's brilliant. Now, I don't actually connect people's brains up to computers like this. So most of you will be leaving with your brains in your heads, don't worry. And I don't really build Wally. -E. We can't actually build Wally -E properly yet. We don't know how to do all the amazing things he can do because he's actually just a cartoon. But we can do lots of pretty impressive things. This is what we're going to talk about today. But first of all, I want to tell you all that you are amazing. Every single one of you is absolutely incredible. Woo, exactly. Give yourselves a woo. All right. I want to prove it to you, though, even though you seem to believe it. I'd like everyone to stand up. I would like everyone to stand on one leg, finger on the nose, and hop up and down. <laughs> All right. And now swap legs. All right. Thank you very much. Give yourselves a round of applause and sit down. Right. So, hopping, hopping up and down. How many of you, how many of you used your brain right then? Did anyone use their brain? So, it required thought to hop up and down? Did it? You thought about it a little bit? Yeah, maybe you didn't want to bump into the gentleman next to you. Maybe a little bit. So if you were thinking a little bit, what about um, this next guy? He's hopping. He's doing what you were doing. He's not got his finger on his nose. He's not swapping legs, but he's hopping. So is he thinking when he's doing that? Who thinks he's thinking, yes or no? Yes? Yes? Put your hands up if you think, yes, he's thinking. Hands up if you think, no, he's not thinking. Okay, most people seem to think, no, he's not thinking. That's very interesting. This robot is pretty famous. He's called Asimo. And he's been in development for a very long time. 33 years. This first robot back here at the left-hand side was built in 1980. 33 years ago. Now that's almost as old as some of your teachers. Almost. Sorry, teachers. So, he's so amazing, isn't he? He can hop up and down, just like you were doing. He can walk upstairs as well. So impressive. Can you walk upstairs? Hmm. Maybe not so clever as we thought. Has anyone else fallen upstairs or fallen downstairs when you, you just take two steps and then fall over? Yeah, so sometimes you do as well, but you did, probably didn't fall over in the same way that he did, just kind of go like that. You probably put your hands out to stop you, because you're smart, you're clever. So what do computers find difficult? Clearly, the computer inside the robot here was finding that task of walking upstairs pretty difficult, and hopping up and down. It took 33 years to make it do that. 
Now, there's a computer inside your phone, if you have a phone. There's a computer right here. There's a computer here. There are computers everywhere in our lives now. And some things they find difficult, and some things they find not so difficult. So which way round is it? What's difficult and what's not so difficult? For this, I'm going to need a couple of volunteers. So I'm going to need a student and a teacher. So if you're with your teacher, point to your teacher and we will try to identify somebody. <laughs> Who have we got? Have we, oh, we got a lot of... Okay, all right. So I think you have to come on up and you have to bring... Who are you going to bring with you? Who would you like to embarrass? Oh, James. Okay, give them a round of applause as they come up. You'd like to come over here, sir? What's your name? My name's John. John Hughes. Mr. Hughes, okay. So we're going to come over here. So Mr. Hughes and James. So James, I'm going to give you this. And uh, if you just come over here so everyone can see you. So on the screen, can I ask what you teach, Mr. Hughes? Um, ICT. You teach ICT. That's fantastic. Have you ever done any maths? Little bits of maths from school. Okay, so on the screen behind you, I'm going to put up some sums. Okay. And I'd like you to do them using this computer okay. in your head. And James is going to do it with this computer, a different type of computer. So are we ready? Yeah. And if anyone in the audience knows the answer, feel free to shout out as well. Okay, we ready? Here's one. Uh, 29. 29. Oh, I heard 29. 29. I heard 29 here as well. So, James? 29. 29, okay. <laughs> okay, so that seemed to work out quite well. Let's try another one. Are we ready? James, are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Everyone, remember, you can shout out if you want to. Mr. Hughes, you ready? I am. Uh, 20, uh, 169. 169. Did you cheat? Did I you did, hear I, I, them? I heard I, them, I, yeah. Yes, okay. So, Somebody here. let's check, James. What do you think? 169. Okay, well done. It's getting so, harder. we're doing okay. We're doing okay. One more. Are we ready? Mr. Hughes. Uh, 15. <laughs> 15? Yeah. 15. I think it's a bit bigger than 15. Yeah. Are we ready? Uh, what do we think? Do we get the microphone? I think it's orange, the answer. <laughs> uh, Jeez. <laughs> It's a big number, apparently. Yeah, it's um, 400, uh, so 400, um, 4,000,000, uh, three, Yes, well done. Okay, thank you very much. Give them a round of applause as they go back to their seats. Uh, Mr. Hughes, would you just catch this for me, please? That's very good. Well done. Would you throw it back for me, please? Oh. <laughs> Was that difficult? Okay, well, thank you very much. Give him a round of applause as he goes back to his chair. So, some things there, Mr. Hughes seemed to find a bit difficult. Some things, like the ball, catching the ball, seemed to find easy. Was it easy to catch the ball? Yeah. And how about the sums? Uh, it, got more difficult. it got a bit more difficult. How about some quadratic equations? Would you like to do some quadratic equations in your head for us? Not today, okay, well. Yeah, so there are some things that computers find hard and some things that computers find easy and some things that humans find hard and some things that humans find easy. So it seemed that for Mr. Hughes and most humans, doing maths, doing all these hard sums, is pretty hard, you know, it's difficult. And doing things like catching a ball that seems to be quite easy, doesn't it? You know, you catch ball, catch a ball every day of your life, probably. But for computers, for a robot to do, remember, a robot is just a computer on legs. It's the other way around. And virtually everything that computers find hard, we find easy, and vice versa. Even this thing in the middle, chess, we find pretty tough, but computers, not so tough nowadays. There are some pretty good chess playing computers out there. So let's talk about that. Chess. Who plays chess? Yeah? Okay, quite a few of you. Do you think when you play chess? 
Yeah? So it needs thought, does it? It needs thought to play chess? Who thinks yes? Yes? Thought to play chess? Okay, great. So does that mean, if it needs thought to play chess, that my phone is thinking when it plays chess with me? It's following patterns, so does that mean it's not thinking then? It's following detailed instructions, yes. We have a genius in the front row here. So, yes, it's, it's following some kind of pattern, so maybe it doesn't require as much thought as we thought. This is Gary Kasparov. This picture was taken about 16 years ago, and he played chess against a computer. Now, the thing about Gary is he was one of the best chess players in the entire world at the time. He's what's called a grand master at chess. And he played chess against a computer called Deep Blue. And this computer searched through every possible part of its memory banks on how to play chess against Gary, and it beat him. And it was the first time in history that a computer had beaten a human a really proper, really good human at playing chess. And that was a bit of a revolution. People suddenly started to think, well, maybe what we think of as thought, what we consider thought, isn't actually thought because computers seem to be able to do it and play chess. So, maybe we need to reconsider the idea of thought. How would we even know if a computer was thinking when it was playing chess. Does anyone know who this is? Yeah. Alan Turing, yeah. So this is Alan Turing. He is, was a very smart man. He actually um, laid the foundations for everything we know as computer science nowadays. And he worked in various places, but one of the places he actually worked was here at the University of Manchester. And in 1950, he asked a very particular question. He thought, could a computer ever think? That, you know, in 1950, the whole idea of computers wasn't really very widely known. They'd only just really been invented. So for Alan to suddenly go, well, I wonder if it could think. That was a pretty big question to ask and to consider. So he tried to figure out how he would know if the computers they were building at the time, and he was working on the very first type of computer that could store programs in its memory, as we think of today, he was working on that here at the University of Manchester. And he imagined a scenario where he would test whether a computer was actually thinking. And nowadays we know it as the Turing test. And his test had a room well, two rooms. In one of those rooms, there was a person. And in the other room, there was a computer. But it was a clever computer in some way. And the person in the people or the person in the room could type, and the computer could send messages as well. But they could only communicate with Alan via email or messages. So he couldn't speak to them or see them. He would just send emails or texts back and forward. And Alan considered, well, if the only way I could communicate was by seeing messages from inside these rooms, how would I know which one's the computer? And you might think, well, you know, of course, I'll be able to tell which one's the computer, because it will just do computery things. Well, let's try. So this is a genuine transcript from what's called a clever bot. Um, and a clever bot is something that can communicate in this sort of way, doing the Turing test. And in one of the rooms is a clever bot, a computer, talking. And in, one of the, in the other room, there is a human. So I say, first of all, hello to the thing in room one. And I, the, the thing in room one replies and says, hi, how can I help you? Are you a computer? So I just ask it straight away. No, 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 my name's Sarah, of course. Well, maybe a computer wouldn't lie, so maybe it is a, a person. And I change the subject. I say, well, my car's broken, to see how 
the thing in room one responds. And I hear, well, sorry to hear that. So it seems to be able to know that you know, that's a bad thing. In room two, I say, hi, how you doing? How are you? And the thing in room two replies, I'm all right. How are you? It's like that. And then I say, you're a computer. Again, just ask. Does that matter? And then I reply, well, yeah, because I'd, I'd win the game then, and I could win the Turing test. Well, my name's Tom, and I'm a person. So I'm a person on this side, and over here, the, person, the, the thing has said, no, my name's Sarah. So both rooms have claimed that they're people. So which one do we think is actually a person? Which one's actually a computer? Shout out room one if you think it's if you think the computer is room one. And if you think it's room two, computer? Okay, it's about balance there, maybe. Yeah. So, what's the answer? Ah. So it was about balanced, but it turned out that the thing on the right, room two, was actually the computer. And this little trick that might have fooled you, the how are you up there, well, all we've done there is replace the word A-R-E, R, with the letter R. And that's a pretty simple thing for a computer to do, just search and replace in text. You can do that with Microsoft Word every day. So all it does is have these little rules which make it look like it's a, hum look like it's a human using text speak or missing out punctuation in the I'm part there. But it's pretty simple to get a computer to do that nowadays. But the thing is, here, you just saw six lines of communication with these rooms. To pass the Turing test, a computer has got to convince four judges over 20 minutes, having conversations about any subject at all. And no computer has ever passed this test. Very, very difficult. There's actually a million dollar prize if you can make a computer pass this test put up by a man, a millionaire called Hugh Loebner in America. But no computer's ever done it yet. Now the Turing test, Alan thought, well, if I ever would meet a computer that would pass my test, and I would see it communicating, it looks like it's thinking, so maybe it is. Maybe. Because I think that it's thinking. Maybe it is actually thinking. That's a bit of a weird thing to say. But how do I know that you're actually thinking? How do I know that you're thinking? How do I know that you're not robots? How do you know you're not just a computer inside a body? And Alan thought, how do I really know that the people around me are thinking? We don't really know. And this is the principle of the Turing test, that if a computer could behave like it's clever, like it's intelligent, like it's thinking, maybe that's enough. Maybe it is doing everything we would want from it. So, But what about all the different things you can do? You can do a lot of stuff. So you can see things. You're amazing. I told you earlier on. You can see things. You can recognize things. You can move around. You can learn. And you can listen, talk, and communicate. You can do some pretty impressive things. So which one of these needs the most thought? Who thinks seeing and recognizing things needs the most thought? One, two, three, four, a few people. Who thinks moving around and jumping and moving around needs the most thought? No? OK. Who thinks listening and talking requires the most thought? OK, a few. And who thinks learning requires the most thought? Ah. So most people think learning requires a lot of thought. So does that mean you're all thinking in class when you're learning? Yeah, if you, if you say that here, that means you're promising that you're going to be thinking next time you go into class and your teachers are listening. So, learning, maybe. Well, let's take that one later, but let's just talk about seeing things and recognizing things. How would a computer see you or recognize you? Anyone know what that is? What's that? It's an Xbox Kinect, yeah. So an Xbox Kinect is a pretty impressive device. You can play computer games in your living room without a little controller 
and you can just dance around, move your limbs around, and it detects where you are in the room and allows you to play games. That's a pretty cool thing. But how It must be able to see you if it's doing this. So this is what it actually sees. When you're moving around, dancing around like this lady here, what it sees is these blobs and lines connecting them. So it sees joints like this, and it, sometimes it sees blocks for your body, and it can see you in several different ways, like this. Sometimes it can detect where you're stepping. You can see the little pulses on the floor where it's heavier. Or sometimes it will see you like this, when it can figure out where the different parts of your body are and how far they are away from you. It's a pretty cool thing. But how is it seeing you? So if you're in your room, in your living room, dancing around, what the Kinect device does is shoot out a little beam of infrared light. So on my hand here, from my little pointer, I've got red light. But infrared light is even further down the spectrum of light, and it's actually invisible light. It's a much longer wavelength of light, as it's called. And it's invisible to the naked eye. But we can actually see it if we use a computer. So down here I have a little Kinect device. Could I ask you to stand up and kneel down here? You can, can we see all the little dots on the gentleman's face? So if you just move your shoulders like this, move your shoulders. can you see all the little dots on his shirt? So this is what the Kinect sees when it sees you. It can see all the little dots, and when the then dots move in a particular pattern, moving in this way or that way, it means that your shoulder's pointing this way or that way. And it can figure out from all those dots moving all the time, because it's a very fast computer, it can figure out where you're standing. OK, thank you very much. OK, give them a round of applause. OK, so the infrared light comes out, and it, it projects these dots onto you. This is in your living room, genuinely, when you're playing like that. The light reflects from you, just like normal light reflects off a mirror. But because the dots are in a particular configuration when you're doing this or that, the Kinect can go, aha, right, the dots are in that particular pattern. That means the hand's pointing upwards, or the shoulder, or the knee, or something else is happening. And it's because it's got a big memory, it can figure out, given that pattern, that means they're doing this. And it does this, the computer just asks the Kinect what's out there in the world. The Kinect uses that dot pattern to figure out which bits are you, because you, you, you are moving, your dots move, whereas the dots in the background of the furniture don't move. So it can figure out which bits you and which bits the background. From that, it can turn you into a little stick man, and it can figure out where your joints are. And from that, it can figure out which bit of the joint is you know, your wrist or your elbow or your head. So it has these little rules that say, well, you know, the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone, so if I detect the knee bone, I know the thigh bone's just above it. So it has these little rules, and it goes round and round and round, just doing this consist continually detecting where you are. And because of these patterns that it detects, you can play the games. So it's pretty impressive. It can see you. It can also see several people at once, and it can track where they are. So here it is, tracking three different people, giving them different colors, yellow, blue, and green. And it can figure out which person is which. Now that's pretty impressive. I can look around, and I can see which person is which in this room. And so can the Kinect. So does that mean it's thinking? Well. We talked about all these things earlier on, and thinking seems to be not such e so easily definable now. What about this next one, listening? We talked about moving and jumping around, and we saw that the robot earlier on could move around. We talked about seeing, and it seems that the Kinect can see and so on. So maybe neither of those actually needs thought. Listening and talking, well, what does a computer perceive when you talk to it? Computers, as you know, they just work on numbers. So when you speak, 
like into this microphone, the signal from the microphone gets converted into electricity, goes into the computer, and what the computer perceives is little pulses of electricity going up and down, up and down. And when I speak louder, the pulses go higher. When I speak softer or in a different tone of voice, maybe loud, deep, or, or high-pitched, the pulses change configuration. And again, because of this pattern-finding ability, the computer can figure out that that particular pattern or things close to that mean, how are you? And we can do this even in a phone nowadays. So you can talk to computers and they can respond to you. Let's see how this one does. So this is Google. I don't know if any of you have tried this yet, but if you, see, if you go onto Google, you can see a little button over on the right-hand side, and that says search by voice. So let's try it. Tell me about Manchester United. Manchester United is playing Wigan Athletic on the 11th of August at 1500 hours. So it seems pretty clever. It knows the Man United schedule and it could figure out that I meant the football team from that. That's pretty clever. Let's try on something else, like a sum we had from earlier on. What's the square root of 17? Square root 17 is 4.12. So again, it seems pretty clever. It's figuring out what I mean from these patterns in the, the signals going up and down. It's converting that into figuring out that I want a particular thing from it. It, wants, it, wants, I, it knows that I want it to do a calculation. And then it's giving me the answer. That's pretty clever. So is it thinking? Who thinks Google is thinking? Hands up. A little bit. OK. OK. So it seems to be pretty clever. So I'm, I'm logged in there, as you can see. You can see my name at the top left-hand corner. And that's inside Google. And you can see a little picture of me up there. So, you know, he knows who I am. What's my name? Oh, no. Did you forget your name? So, <laughs> maybe it's not as clever as we thought. It's got my name up there on the screen. It's got a photo of me. I've been using it for years, and it doesn't know what my name is. Maybe it's not as clever as we thought. So, it's not so clever, but sometimes it seems to be clever. Well, right, well, let's think about the next one on the list, learning. Now, everyone at the beginning said that learning requires the most thought, and the others, well, no, maybe they don't need thought. So let's consider this. I'm going to need a volunteer again. This time it's going to be a teacher, and I'm going to embarrass them. So if you'd like to volunteer your teacher, shout out the name of your teacher. <laughs> what can I hear? Mr. OK, give him a round of applause as he comes up. Thank you very much, sir. What's your name, Mr. James? Mr. James. Mr. James? Okay. Okay. All right, would you like to come up on stage? Okay, so up on the screen just behind you, um, well, you can read them from here if you want. Up on the screen, on, on the screen, there are going to be some instructions. So here's, I've got my teacher. So there are going to be some instructions, and I'd like you to follow the instructions, okay? You ready? Okay. Ready? One. Position the right shoulder joint at 270 degrees, polar coordinates with a protrusion of 5 degrees beyond the body plane. Can we not do that? Oh, oh okay, all right, 270 degrees, okay, right, yes. Are we ready? Okay, that took a little bit. Okay, next one. Oh, come on, Mr. James. Oh, okay, oscillate. Okay, all right, next one, next one, next one, next one. Okay, come on. Can, can we, oh, okay, oh, that's really close, that's really close. Okay, thank you very much. Give him a round of applause as he goes back to his desk. So... Was this hard to do, sir? Mr. James, was, was, this, was this hard to do? It was quite hard to do. So I gave you a very precise list of instructions. So why was it so hard to do? Well, let's try something else. 
I'm going to get this robot to follow those instructions and see if it can do it better than you did. But I'd like everybody to just copy what the robot does. Are we ready? Yeah? Everyone ready? I want full audience participation here. Okay. So just copy what the robot does, whatever it does. Okay? So it's, it's like it's standing up. Everybody stand up. Hi, Chris. Would you like to see me do a dance? Yes. Yes. That's cool. Plus, I really like the dance. Okay, well Which done. Which dance would you like to see me perform? It's doing very well. Gangnam. Gangnam. Are you ready? One, two, three. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Op, 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 op. Open Gangnam Style. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Give yourselves a round of applause. That was very impressive. So, that was really impressive. How, but how did the robot do it? I gave the instructions to the gentleman, but he couldn't quite do it. But robots can follow instructions. Computers can follow precise instructions very, very well. So I just gave the equations describing where he should move his arms, and he could do it just by articulating his joints. And when it comes to dancing, well, we just take Psi, we write computer code, equations and instructions that describe how we want the robot to dance, and it can just do it because we tell it how to do it. But you, you just saw how to do it. You saw a, maybe a YouTube video or something like that, and you just copied. You learned from examples of how to dance like that. That was pretty impressive. And you are pretty impressive. You're amazing, as I said. You can just learn. How do you do these things? You learn how to stack blocks when you were younger. You're hopefully learning something today. You're learning lots of things all the time. But could a computer ever learn? Who thinks a computer could learn? Hands up. Okay, a few, okay. So, as it turns out, yes, anyone with their hands up was right. And though we can't quite do as impressive things as Wally -E yet, we can do something called machine learning. And this is the subject that I work in. So this subject called machine learning, I'm now gonna to describe to you roughly how it works. So we can take this, a computer, and we show the computer ex examples of what we want it to do. Just like I showed you. I showed you the robot doing this, and you could just copy. You, you, you saw what, what we wanted, and you could do it. Inside the computer is what's called a mathematical model. Now don't worry about the word mathematical there. It's just sums and equations, things that you are either learning now, or you will learn in a couple of years' time. It's just things like algebra and probabilities, they're all what make up a mathematical model. Maybe slightly more advanced things like calculus, that forms a big part of mathematical models. But those are things that you'll learn when you do GCSEs or A-levels, and even more things if you come to university. So we show these examples to the computer, and then a human supervisor kind of gives it the thumbs up or the thumbs down, says, yeah, well done, you know, you're doing very well. And inside the computer's head, inside the computer's memory, it's reconfiguring itself. It's trying lots of different configurations of the equations and the coefficients in there, changing them around, doing sums, trying to find a situation that the, com that the human will be happy with. But it's doing all this automatically. Eventually, when the human is happy, gives a smile and says, yes, okay, that's it, you're done, the computer can stop in a particular configuration and spit out this finished model. And this model will be able to be used for, for example, a dancing robot. But it was never programmed explicitly saying, this is where you should move your arm, or you should do this, or you should do that. It was just given examples saying, this is what I mean by dancing. 
and it tried to do it. And then the human said, good, bad, okay, maybe in the middle. And it adjusted itself like you would. Now you might think that um, dancing robots are not so useful in society. But things like this, your camera phone or camera, this is actually designed by computers learning as well. So all of these children in these photographs, they've not been brought into a big laboratory somewhere and pictures taken of their faces so we know what they look like so we can draw little boxes around their faces when they look into a camera next time. And you know, if a baby is born and you point a camera at it, you can still, the camera will still pick out the face. So it hasn't been explicitly programmed with this is the face you should pick out. Instead, what happened is that the computer program in the laboratory somewhere was shown lots of examples of faces, saying this is a face, this is a face, this is a face. This is not a face, maybe showing a picture of a wall or a football. And just from those examples, it was able to pick out patterns, general patterns, that meant this is a face, maybe with eyes and ears and thing, you know, eyes a particular kind of angle, maybe ears at a particular position on the head, but it could generalize as well and kind of figure out the general structure of a face is this, and that's what is in your camera phone nowadays. It's not just phones and drawing little boxes around faces. If you ever shopped online, if you ever used Amazon, you have been the human supervisor giving the thumbs up or the thumbs down. If you've ever clicked fix this recommendation on Amazon or given a four out of five stars or five out of five stars saying, yes, I really like that book, uh, Algorithms in a Nutshell. If you click that and say, yes, I really like that, behind the scenes, inside the big computers at Amazon, the computer program is adjusting itself, changing all of its equations around and figuring out the general patterns of stuff you like, such that next time it can recommend a good book like maybe simply JavaScript, something else that you might like. But it does all this automatically, just from the feedback that you give it. And yes, you might think, well, this is just shopping, but there's another fib I told you earlier on. I said that the Kinect had little rules inside it to say this is an elbow and so on. In fact, the Kinect learned how to see you. So they didn't just in the same way that we don't have people walking into labs and taking, you know, checking what their faces look like. What they did to build the Kinect was they got a few people, I think it was a couple of thousand people, and they looked at them and they sort of labeled their knees and said right to the computer, this is a knee, this is an elbow, this is a shoulder, and so on. And then the Kinect figured out the general patterns of which bit is a knee in anybody. So all these people have different body shapes. He couldn't possibly see every possible body shape or every possible angle at which I could move my arms and legs. But it figured out general patterns. But it did that by learning. There are other things that are not even on the market yet, but are in research laboratories. This is the Google self-driving car. And you might think, wow, you know, that's science fiction. Does anyone know who this up here is at the top right? Who's that? It's Kit, yeah. That's David Hasselhoff, more, more well known nowadays for being on, uh, is it uh, Pop Idol or something like that? Uh, I think so. Uh, but a long time ago, that was science fiction. That was like, you know, you know, you couldn't imagine a car that could speak to you or recognize your voice and drive around by itself. But it's happening now. This is what the Google self-driving car sees. In the same way that the Kinect beams out the little patterns of light, the Google car does it in a similar sort of way using a different, using a laser instead of the infrared. And the green bits are things that it's been taught not to bump into. Those are people or, you know, walls and things. The blue bits are things that it's been taught, saying, right, you can drive on that, that's called a road. 
But all the while, it was taught in the research laboratory, you can drive on that, you can't drive on that, figure out the general pattern, and it learnt the rest of it. It didn't have to be shown every possible road in the world. It was taught general patterns and it figured out the rest itself. You can see the person at the top right here just driving along. You can see how fast they're moving because there's a, a motorway and there's a fast car up here. And they're just hands off the wheel and it can steer, it can change lanes, it can do anything, that mostly anything that a human can do. So this is pretty impressive. But the thing is, was that car thinking? Was Google thinking? Was the robot thinking? Was the Kinect thinking? Oh, maybe we have to reconsider what we consider thought now. The thing is, all of these things you can all do. And remember what I said at the very beginning, you are amazing. You can do all these things from when you're this age, from when you're very young. You can recognize faces. A baby can look up and see where its mother is straight away. And it can learn things and it can see and hear and all these things. You can do all these things in one package. So how do you do it? Well, you have one of these, a brain. And inside your brain, I've got a little model here. Inside your brain are lots of little neurons, as they're called, cells. And these little neuron cells in your brain, if I break open the brain here, right deep within your brain and all over it, these little neurons are firing tiny little pulses of electricity around. And when you were very young and your mum said, yes, well done, or gave you a big smile, when you said your first word, like mama, that kind of changed the connections inside your brain. Connections between particular neurons started to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's the process of learning. You were able to learn by all these neurons flashing electricity and getting stronger connections between them. And weaker connections, the ones that weren't necessary, were killed off. They were just rubbed away and they weren't needed. So you figured out inside here what neural connections you needed. And these are just tiny little cells inside. You know, they're just smaller than you can imagine. And you have a hundred billion of these cells inside your brain. That's a lot. But the thing is, how could we ever get computers to do this? How could we get computers to learn in the same way that you do, by having neurons? Well, maybe we don't need to. What we can, in fact, do is make simulations of neurons. So don't be worried by the equations here. This is just, this is kind of the language which computer scientists use sometimes. And it's just a language of communicating what we mean by these mathematical models. But again, your teachers will tell you these things are all things that you would learn in late, maybe late GCSEs or early A-level maths. These are called derivatives. And it's just a way of writing stuff down. And you'll learn all this sort of stuff about how these equations mean this later on in your school life and then maybe a bit more when you come to university. But what we were doing here is we can actually have these kind of models of neurons, kind of simulations that are not exactly like the neurons or as clever as the neurons in your head, but a bit like them. So if the neurons in your head are kind of like a Formula One car doing all these incredible things, the neurons that we can simulate, that we can make and have pretend neurons inside the computer here, they're kind of like this. Kind of a shopping trolley, maybe rolling down a hill. Not so good. Or maybe a model car at best. So we can't, we can't like, you know, invent terminators and robots that can do everything that you can do yet. So I want to tell you a true story. Genuinely true story. So. It's 1986. Cast your mind back, teachers. You might remember that time. In a university laboratory somewhere in America, there was a man. His name was Terry. 
I won't try to pronounce his second name. Senovsky, it says. But his, he was working in the lab, working on a very old computer. The computer there is hundreds of times less powerful than the computer in your phone nowadays. So a very slow computer compared to what you've got. And what Terry was doing was using these models of neurons, using these kind of mathematical things which simulated the way the tiny little neurons in your head behaved. And there was kind of artificial electricity flowing around the connections inside his neuron, his network of neurons. And what Terry wanted to do was to show examples of syllables pronouncing words to this simulation. So when you see the letters C and H next to each other, you know that means CH. And when you see the letters A and H next to each other, you know that means A. Ah. And from different patterns of letters, you know what sounds come from each of those because you know how to read. What Terry wanted to do was try to get a computer to do the same thing, to learn how to read. So he wanted, from showing it just syllables or showing it words and showing it some examples of, well, when you see C and H together, that means ch, just like teaching a baby to talk. So he wanted it to come out and be able to say words. So it was late at night in this laboratory. And Terry was getting tired, and he thought, it's time to go home. I've been working hard enough all day. So as he was leaving the office, he pressed the keyboard and pressed enter, and he heard... He heard that. So that didn't sound much like talking. It's just, you know, sounds. Not really even human-sounding sounds. But a few hours later, after these artificial neurons had had a chance to kind of connect to each other in different ways and see the examples that Terry had provided. It sounded like that. So it's starting to sound a little more human. It's kind of making syllables. Where, 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 where. And the next morning, when Terry came in, the weather today looks good outside. It is sunny. The computer had learned how to read. And he had just shown it newspapers and given it the weather report, and it had been able to read it to him in the morning. He didn't ever program into it the rules, this is how to read, and so on. He'd shown it examples, and it had learned how to do it by getting rid of the connections that it doesn't need. If you remember, this network was much bigger when I first started, and it's pruned away the bits that it doesn't need. So Terry's simulation, this kind of model of the way the little cells in the brain behaves, had 300 neurons inside it. Now that's about enough for a tiny little worm tiny little worm just floating around in the water. So it doesn't mean that worms are going to suddenly start speaking to us, but if these neurons are programmed in a particular way, it means we can actually get that many neurons to learn things. But the thing is, this was 1986. So many years later, this is what we're doing. So this is Professor Steve Ferber. He works here at the University of Manchester, and he is working not just on these mathematical models of how neurons communicate and so on, but on making microchips, computers, that can behave like that. And he's not just able to simulate 300 of these little cells inside your brain, but a billion of them. I'll take some questions at the end. So, 2014, that's when the computer is going to be finished, the one that he's building. And that's when we think it will have these simulations of all these neurons. And it's a pretty impressive thing. It's not suddenly going to start talking or living or communicating with us. Um, this is about enough 
for a worm, this actually turns out to be the same number of neurons that are in a cat or 10 mice. That doesn't mean that we're suddenly going to have a robot cat running around everywhere. Because even programming something as simple as a cat is incredibly difficult. Cats are pretty clever things. They can do lots of stuff. And though we know how to make simulations of all these neurons that are you know, really, really big, we can't make something as clever as a cat yet. I want to tell you one more true story now. Does anyone recognize who this is? Anyone recognize who's the geeky kid? Who, who is it? It's me. <laughs> it is, yes. So this is me. This was me, age 13, long time ago. When I was 13, I read a magazine article in a PC magazine. And inside that article was the story that I've just told you about this network of things that could learn how to speak. And I loved it. I loved the whole idea of this idea that computers could learn. So I became fascinated by this. And I went to university to study computer science, which was the thing, the, the area that I needed to know in order to know how to do this myself. And as the years went by, I studied harder and harder. And now I work here. And I'm a researcher in what's called artificial intelligence, which is the name for all the areas that I've been talking to you about today. I thought it was amazing. And I get to do this cool stuff every single day. Now maybe, in a few years, you'll be doing stuff that, I hope you'll be doing stuff that you think is incredibly cool. Maybe you'll be building the new self-driving cars of tomorrow. Maybe you'll be building hover cars that can fly to where they want to go to and have to navigate by themselves. Maybe you'll be inspired by something else, something in the movies that you really think is cool and you want to make a computer do those things. Maybe something like Iron Man here, the clever computer there. Or maybe you'll think of something that isn't even in the public eye yet. So this is a kind of artist's mock-up. This is just a picture of a robot astronaut that NASA, the space agency, hopes that they might one day be able to build completely and send out to explore the solar system. But in order to do that, it'd have to be a pretty clever robot. It would have to do all the things that we've been talking, out, talking about today in one package and more. So it's a long, long way off. Maybe you'll be doing stuff like that. But whatever you choose your future to be, I hope you're inspired by today and by lots of other things you've seen in your studies and here today at Manchester. And have fun. Enjoy it. So thank you very much. I'll finish there.